Hello and welcome to yet another episode of uh, Captains of Industry where we look at uh, industry leaders and the role that they've played in the current positions that they serve and their immediate past and what they think is the way forward. Today we have a conversation with our special guest, Mr. Hannington Namara. Uh, he has over 15 years of experience as a senior private sector development specialist, currently the managing director of Equity Bank uh, here in Rwanda. Before joining the bank, he was country director of Trademark East Africa. We managed to have him on the show a few, a few uh, times, just uh, guiding us through coordination and uh, representing uh, the interests of the business community in Rwanda as well. So we'll just get a bit of background. Uh, thank you very much for creating time to speak to us. Now, let's uh, start off from uh, uh, a bit of background. Now, you are a graduate of Makerere uh, University Business School with a degree in BA. Of course, uh, you picked up uh, the education bit on the side, but as a student from Makerere, did you ever fathom that you'd be leading one of the largest banks in the region? Well, thank you so much, first of all, for having me on the show. Um, you know, as any young person, you would have had... Uh, uh, aspirations you'd have had uh, uh, ambitions that you know opened up the horizon to allow you to be anything you wanted to be so coming out of university I didn't know I would even end up in banking but I knew I would be a player in the economy I know I knew I would, I would add my two cents and I was determined to uh, do whatever it takes to ensure that I can add my one or two cents to the development of the country. Right. Uh, what about settling in? Because we'd imagine from a career the exposure um, within the course that you studied was that business, uh, you would want to practice what you studied in the most advanced economy, which was Kenya at that particular point, I would imagine. So how come you settled? Uh, how was that trying to uh, understand where to settle? Well, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a... It's a bit of a, a, a puzzle because, you know, when you come out of school, you're open to anything. Right. And, um, you know, I had set up uh, for, for Kigali or for Rwanda because uh, of my roots, being a Rwandan. So having spent a lot of the days, been born and bred out of uh, Uganda, studied there, finished my university, I felt it was very compelling because at the time, Again, that was uh, after 1994 when uh, the, the country had uh, been liberated. So I felt it was compelling, uh, following on from you know my siblings, uh, uh, my relatives at large, who had just returned home. I felt compelled to also you know come test home, find out what home is like first of all, and secondly you know f uh, play a role in rebuilding the country. So I was open at, you know, for, for, to many things at that time, but that came in handy. I, I think that was the most ripe opportunity. I could have ended up in uh, anywhere in the region, in Africa or, or in the world. Many of my friends, colleagues uh, ended up uh, going to different places in the world. Um, but I, I think, looking back, I made no mistake settling for Rwanda. Oh, well, definitely. We have a view from the office here. Um, okay. All right, so let's talk about now your journey coming in. Uh, we won't go too far back because that would last maybe more than two hours. But um, you've represented uh, an, an umbrella body, um, working towards business interests of the community, not only here, but even serving outside in the region. Um, just help us understand what you think is the largest misconception about business in Rwanda tied into the region. Well, yeah, it, uh, one has got to look at um, the private sector, Rwanda's private sector in the context of the country. Uh, we're talking hardly a couple of years ago when there used to be some uh, private sector companies but if you did an in-depth look at uh, what those companies were, you would have found that they were probably uh, so-called private sector companies, but are dependent on government business. Many of them would be those that are supplying government uh, supplies or goods and services or, or whatever it is they were doing in form of contracting that all centered around government business. Uh, it's only then that the new government, the government uh, that uh, RPF brought in, ushered in, uh, that started looking at how do we create a private sector ecosystem that is beyond, yes, can do business with government, but it is beyond um, uh, government business. And that's how he started looking at some of the telecoms coming in, MTN was an example, the service sector, the banks coming in, uh, you know, the investors coming into many different uh, sectors of the economy. 
And we've started seeing uh, uh, a creation of a resilient private sector. So you have companies that don't even know that, for example, government uh, services are important for them, except when it comes to paying taxes or doing anything. But otherwise, uh, their, their buyers and suppliers are purely private. And that is what you see when you look into every sector, should it be you know, services or tourism or transport, logistics, or, or, or financial services. You find that there are companies that are actually trading between themselves. Ultimately, the government becomes um, a key player because uh, in the context of the economy, again, in the context of the country, uh, government being the largest consumer of services or even the largest spender on services and goods. Uh, but we're beginning to see a bit of, you know, tilt, should I call it that way, that you now see a bit more of private sector and less of government. And right. if that and continues, more prominence. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, and that continues, then you can have a proper pri functioning private sector. Right. So in the context of the economy, uh, the private sector here uh, is also not in, uh, isolated. It is also connected to that of the region, for example. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, trade businesses, uh, goods and services that come from within the, the, the region, uh, far and beyond. Uh, a, lot, a lot more of it coming from Kenya, for example. Uh, what you call fast-moving consumer goods uh, coming from the region, but also beginning to see some of them being produced here under the Made in Rwanda initiative. Uh, there are also these businesses that are in Rwanda or the private sector that also does business with the region and beyond. Uh, you know, Rwanda here is an example. It transports people to the region and beyond. And there are others, the guys who are in transport and logistics do transport uh, for, for, for companies in Uganda, Tanzania, uh, and, and beyond. Um, even services, we're beginning to see our young chaps, ICT uh, chaps, uh, rendering their services as far as Brazzaville, right. as far as West, uh, Western Africa. So that is beginning to also form. That shows you that there is uh, a bit of resiliency in private sector that is building up. Uh, and that they have something to offer to the world. Right. Now, trade then brings everything together. And it's up to the financiers yes. now to ensure that everything moves in uh, is as streamlined as possible. Um, yes. uh, let's talk about, um, now you've created context and we know the background. Let's talk about uh, the branding of the bank, right? Uh, Equity Bank, of course, origins in Kenya. And in Kenya, it was known as um, the SME Bank. And it branded itself that way with numerous branches, of course, later on they got to cut them. So how was it trying to work out what kind of a bank it is for the Rwandan population? Well, uh, Equity Bank, first of all, the ethos of Equity Bank and, 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 and the reason why uh, they chose Rwanda as, a, as an investment destination. Uh, Equity Bank at the heart of our DNA uh, you know, our mission and vision is to help transform lives of Africans uh, socially and economically by, by offering them or bringing to them uh, innovative financial solutions. Now, where the bank is born out of Kenya, uh, the history of it in 1980s was a building society, later became some form of microfinance, later became only opened up actually um, its headquarters in Kenya in 2004, and, and ever since uh, the rest was history. In 2009, the borders of Kenya, I think, became too small for, for Equity <laughs> Bank and decided to open up branches, and one of the markets they looked at was Rwanda. Rwanda, of course, for many very obvious reasons, um, you know, the right investment uh, climate, but also the, the right place that, uh, that uh, equities uh, uh, services would be delivered because why we succeeded in the region, uh, it is not because the bank was doing anything beyond um, what others can do, but it was our understanding of what uh, what role technology plays in, uh, in in the success of any company or any industry. Uh, we were the first ones to, to venture into agency banking and people thought, how is this going to be possible? Uh, and, and we showed that it can be done because we leverage on technology. Uh, our shareholders are very conversant about uh, the role of technology, invested heavily in uh, technology, 
that then when we are looking at Rwanda, uh, you know, having fiber uh, cable laid across the country, the economic policies and, 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 and government policies all supportive of uh, the, uh, leveraging technology, uh, setting up uh, the bank here wasn't uh, uh, the hardest thing because we were in line with what uh, the government of Rwanda policies here was, was, was promoting. So when we came to, to this market here, uh, 2010, I, I happened to have been at that time uh, still in the banking sector and I, before I went into private sector. Uh, and I knew equity from the region of what it has done. In many ways, uh, if you look at it uh, five years after, uh, we probably now should say are in, uh, in the top five banks, I would say. Very uh, modest. You're <laughs> very modest about it. Yeah. Yes, in the top five banks uh, in terms of size. Uh -huh. But I would want to also believe that we're in the first tier banks when it comes to impact, when it comes to what we've been able to do, true to our mission, transforming lives. Our, our agency platform here again is the largest, uh, that we, 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 we now have about 1,500 agents uh, in places that are remote that would never have you know, been worthy of opening a branch there, but you know, they now have banking financial services at the agency level. We've also done a couple of other things, disruptive things in the market here, including uh, what we recently launched. We have now, uh, uh, last week Friday, I was, I was launching uh, the digital bank. We have digitized processes of the bank, showed Rwandans that uh, uh, you, know, you don't have to go to a branch anymore. All those things that would have taken to a branch from account opening, and, and I'll you know, uh, relate this to the government policy, account opening for financial inclusion uh, to make sure that whoever, whichever, whoever in, uh, is in the market here or every Rwandan has access to financial services. Right. So not only can you open an account at the uh, agency platform or wherever our agent is, you can also now open it on your mobile. All right. So for financial inclusion, access is a thing of the past. We saw you cut down on uh, trying to maintain uh, and handle your cost efficiency perfectly over the last quarter. And that has been a task for most banks, cutting down on operations and cutting down on losses. Just are you able to quantify uh, how this would uh, in turn uh, have a ripple effect on the bank's numbers? There are 6 million phone users in Rwanda out of 12 million uh, or 11.6 million Rwandans. Uh, out of those 6 million use phones. And we are told that uh, out of those 6 million, at least 30% have smartphones. The others have feature phones. Uh, I would want to believe then that at least there are 6 million Rwandans who can have 6 million accounts. So that in itself, people having the bank in their hands uh, will change the way they've been doing things. Right. Um, of course, we'd like to put a, put a pause there. Uh, when we come back, we get a sense of the uh, numbers. I've been speaking to Huntington Namar, who's the managing director of Equity Bank uh, Rwanda. When we come back, we take a look at uh, the depreciation, depreciation of the Rwandan franc, how they tied in into the bank's mandate, accessing cheap money, and what exactly we intend to see Equity Bank uh, pick on as they move on mid to long term. We'll be right back. Welcome back to today's episode of uh, Captains of Industry. I'm your host, George Ndirango, or at George Ndirango on Twitter. Now, before we left for the break, uh, we were speaking to uh, Hannington Namara, who is the Managing Director at Equity Bank Rwanda, just giving us context of his background. Of course, he made it as uh, modest as possible, but uh, definitely a lot of years in the industry and experience that uh, makes him uh, one of the most reputable names in the industry as is. So um, it's nice to continue with the conversation. Uh, maybe I'll just pick up from uh, where we left. You created context on how the economy was now boiling over to this year. We'll continue with the issue on accessing cheap money for the economy. Now, we've had development finance institutions come in, and they say that their mandate is to channel the stream of funds that comes from the export-import banks and other global institutions to banks uh, in the country, which then lend to SMEs and the general public. But there, there seem to be four levels where if the money passes through, every level it passes adds, adds about 1% or more. How do we ensure that the public or the institutions that are accessing money from you have it at the least price point possible? Thank you so much. And I uh, probably I would paint a picture to 
uh, imported prices. Uh, if, if you look at uh, the money that um, the SMEs or those who would be the private sector businesses here would require, in our view, it is not foreign currency because uh, foreign currency comes with its own, uh, I call it imported prices, comes at a price. And, and uh, for a fact, because of the, uh, the, the, the trade balance between Rwanda and, and uh, those we trade with in the, in the, in the, in the global economy, the, the currency depreciation effect still comes in. And I think the government has done a good job on trying to manage uh, currency depreciation. But the fact is, uh, if you add the effect of currency depreciation over time and add it to the price of what you borrowed at uh, externally, that may be opening up yourself to a, bit, to a risk that you can't manage as, any, as, as, a, as a business in Rwanda. So we believe that the money that Rwandan businesses need is Rwanda francs. Um, and I think to a large extent, uh, that money is available to businesses in the country. Uh, the banks that, that are operating in this economy, uh, the microfinancial institutions, the uh, circles, a bit of savings within the economy uh, can help uh, finance uh, uh, the SME type of, 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 of customers. Yes, one would argue that there is there enough stock of money in the country to steer development. There's more than, there's never enough. Yeah, we still need more, but for what type of businesses? I think if, it, if that money comes in as equity, as a capital, not necessarily loans, it will be useful to the economy. And what about holding hands with other banks? For example, most of these large institutions, uh, large uh, projects coming up, uh, the Bujesera Airport is one. We saw individual banks going at it alone or are trying to increase their portfolio through acquisitions by external banks. Have you worked out a scenario where we can see a lot more convergence of the local banks within these large projects without involvement of any foreign uh, investment? We do a lot of uh, collaboration with, uh, uh, with each other as local banks here. Uh, we syndicate and, and finance. Syndicate. Yes, so we syndicate and finance projects together. Uh, we we do club deals where we, where we know somebody is doing bank A is doing five billion here. I can also do two billion there. And, you know all these things. We do collaborate a lot. And in fact, at uh, uh, RBA, at, uh, as leaders of banks, we sit together and agree that we should share these opportunities because some of them are bigger than one bank. And in fact, if you look at most of the businesses here, if any business is borrowing uh, more than five billion, you'll be sure that that is shared between two, three other banks, okay. uh, maybe with the exception of one bank that can handle that. Okay. But what we've done as equity, uh, we played a very key role in bringing in uh, cheap money into the country. We've used the muscle of the group, being part of uh, the equity group, has helped a lot. We've in fact facilitated about $250 million inflow into projects in Rwanda and at a cheaper rate uh, because of the access of uh, those lines that we got cheaply. We lent to customers here uh, in, um, I'll mention a couple of projects, uh, but at a very affordable rate. So, you know, if you're talking about all landed cost here at 7.5 in dollars, uh, including everything, if you could even add the cost for transporting it, 7.5 that's what you would get from an external agency uh, before you add your own okay. so we, we've he helped those companies get the money but we know that the long-term solution is not remaining uh, in uh, in debts in dollar terms or in foreign currency it is to then convert those uh, uh, loans into Rwanda francs that brings me which brings me to the, the question if you're going to invest in hard currency that's not in the local one um, there was a conversation uh, last year about the nominal and real effect exchange rates appreciating by 2.1 percent and 1.8 percent respectively a case that uh, BNR tried to intervene and ensure that policies were safe for the banks but um, that issue on hard currency versus what you ship out back to where you're domiciled is one that is definitely going to hurt you in terms of operations right so how do you work out a cushion for your exchange we, we, when, when these monies come in first of all uh, they, they come in um, to finance projects that are going to produce value uh, if for example you're financing a project here and it comes in you know of course in dollars 
but depends on what sector is the project. If the sector is in a dollar generating sector, or the company is operating in a dollar generating, foreign currency generating sector, you would assume that it will also contribute to attracting some of the dollars into the country. Yes, a bit of it will be shipped back, but you can imagine if you borrowed 100 million over 10 years, uh, you don't ship the 100 million at once. Yeah. You, you know, if, if that investment is going to be generating more, yeah. and I would mention you know, investments like you know, in Rwanda area that we've had a chance to finance, yeah. to collaborate with, the hotel industry, uh, when uh, customers come in, they, uh, you know, some of them pay, or most of them pay local foreign currency. Yeah. So those would be little additions. But if you're also lending to, to export sectors, uh, coffee, tea, and all the others in dollars, you know for sure you're increasing their capacity to sell more externally yeah. and being able to uh, bring some of those dollars back here. Mm -hmm. Mining sector, the same thing. Yeah. So it depends on where the stocks of loans are going. If they are going into a, a, a sector that has no ability to contribute to uh, the ability of the countries to generate foreign exchange, then for sure, yes, it will ad adversely impact uh, uh, the, the uh, balance of trade. Mm -hmm. But for sure, if you look at the sectors that um, have been attracting foreign, foreign uh, 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 monies, are those sectors that are contributing to uh, the generation of the same. So, and as I said, the, the country doesn't exist alone. We trade with others. Uh, whether we like it or not, there shall be inflow and outflow of, uh, of uh, foreign currency. But I think what needs to be done is expose those sectors that have a, a bit of more ability to generate uh, foreign exchange, uh, do more with them so they can bring in more. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be a healthy point of, uh, of, of, of transactions. Mm -hmm. But if it is the other way around, then it, it poses a challenge to the economy. Yeah, yeah. Right. But we, we do work with Central Bank uh, and uh, the Ministry of Finance in looking at where should those sectors be. Mm -hmm. So when these monies come in, again, they are, you know, these loans are registered with Central Bank. Central bank is aware where this money is going, and if it will, is going to cause an imbalance in the economy, they will have seen it ahead of time. Um, but yes, it, it, we are a free trade economy, so things are in and out. A lot more fluid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so let's talk about what Rwanda has provided on its portfolio. One of them has been bonds, and we've seen some banks shy away because they say the premium attached to the bonds might be relatively high. What's your position on uh, your participation with the bonds that continue to be issued? As, as commercial banks, we, we, we have, um, let me say, we have a responsibility to, to promote private sector. Um, but yes, sometimes we have spare liquidity that we can place with government uh, instruments. Um, and in fact, when you look at most banks' balance sheets, uh, the investments with the central bank or government papers are somewhere between 20-30% which is largely acceptable. The biggest percentage being 70% uh, of the bank's balance sheets is loans to private sector. It's a healthy position to be in. Um, we don't shy away from investing in government uh, bonds and, uh, and securities, but because we have a responsibility to, to promote private sector, we spare that cash to give it to private sector, SMEs. You would also argue that uh, they are probably, you would make much more money uh, in the private sector than in government uh, papers. But, uh, you know, you have to put both on balance. Uh, we also have a responsibility to support uh, government initiatives when government uh, issues these papers. We participate. Um, you know, but a healthy balance would be between, you know, if I can give more to private sector, even government would be happy, a bit more happier with me. Because I'm then producing more... <laughs> more private sector who will then pay taxes and will then contribute to uh, government revenue. So if you look at it from one side, you would say that banks are shying away from investing in these papers. Uh, yes, we are uh, reward driven, return driven, sorry, right. but uh, the, the return has to be balanced with the socioeconomic benefits right. of the institution. Final question has to do, are you, are you content with the position you're in? Are you content with the uh, the position you're in in the industry and the mileage that you've made so far or what remains for Huntington? Look, early days to tell. Uh, it's only been five years and a half, almost six years for the bank in, in, in the country. I think looking back, we've done a bit of, uh, uh, 
I should say we punched above our weight. Right. Uh, we are working to make sure that we sustain that and if possible continue to grow it. Our dream is to be amongst uh, the top banks. Uh, you have to ask me the number, I would not go beyond two. <laughs> uh, so that's where I want to go. Right. Uh, so there is a lot of room to, 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 to go uh, forward. I believe uh, this economy is growing and uh, the pace at which it is growing, if the bank can as well grow with it, will be much better. But we want to grow uh, significantly. We're not going to remain where we are. I uh, would appeal to all those who want to grow and are interested in the growth story to come and audit together. That has been uh, your episode of Captains of Industry with me, George Ndirango, and Mr. Hannington Namara. Thank you very much for watching.